Good evening and welcome. My name is Cliff Robinson and I'm the Public Humanities Specialist at the Princeton Public Library. Thank you for joining us for this evening's discussion on the book, Einstein, The Man and His Mind with authors Gary S. Berger and Michael DiRuggiero. This program is presented in partnership by the Historical Society of Princeton and the Princeton Public Library, and it is supported in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities. As you can see, we are using Zoom for tonight's program. Please submit any questions you have for Gary and Michael through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Audience questions will be answered at the end of the discussion. I've also activated closed captioning, so you may utilize this feature by clicking on the arrow to the right of the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom window. This program is being recorded and will be available on the library's YouTube channel a few days after tonight's program. I'd like to now uh, introduce Eve Mendel, Director of Programming and Outreach at the Historical Society of Princeton. Eve will introduce our authors. Eve. Thank you, Cliff, and thank you to everyone joining us tonight for this Pi Day celebration on the 145th anniversary of Einstein's birth. The Historical Society is privileged to be the keepers of our own Einstein collection, which includes 65 pieces of furniture, an oral history of interviews of Einstein's friends and colleagues uh, by author Jamie Sion, and a collection of ephemera given to us by Einstein's good friend, Gillette Griffin, which includes one of the pipes that you see Einstein holding in many of the images in this incredible book that we are featuring tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce the authors. Gary Berger is a retired physician whose introduction to relativity theory was in 1962 during a college course on the history of science. Several decades later, after reading a book about Albert Einstein, Berger developed a deeper desire to understand Einstein's theory. Over time, he began to collect original writings and photographs of Einstein and developed a feeling of familiarity with him as a real person, largely through the photos while gaining a basic understanding of his contributions. It is his hope that Einstein, the man in his mind, will give readers a similar sense of familiarity with this amazing man and his creative mind. Michael DiRuggiero owns the Manhattan Rare Book Company, which focuses on rare books and first editions in literature, art, history, and science. Michael specializes in the history of science with an emphasis on original material relating to Albert Einstein. He was instrumental in the development and organization of Dr. Berger's expanding collection. So welcome to both of you, and thank you so much for being here to discuss this amazing book. Thank you, thank you and happy Pi Day as well. Thank you. I'm going to start it off with a few questions. Uh, we'll get the conversation going, and uh, we were happy to take questions from the audience as well. We have the Q&A box. Um, you can feel free to add questions at any time, and we will uh, take them uh, closer to the end of the discussion. Uh, so the, the first question um, I'd like to, to talk about is, well, the, the book takes the reader through Einstein's life and achievements. Uh, Gary, the basis of this book is your collection, particularly photographs. Would you be able to speak more to that? Um, we're curious about your favorite piece, um, your first piece, uh, et cetera. Well, the photographs um, to me are the essence really of the book the way it's laid out um they are they do show albert einstein from age 16 uh up to age 76 uh shortly just a few months before his death and with each photo uh we give a little commentary uh that explains basically what einstein did why he, why he's such a genius. And um, you get the feeling from the photographs of him as a real person. Uh, so it's not just, you know, Einstein, the genius or the icon, but uh, at least that's what it, the photographs have done for me. Um, so I started when I was in, um, I guess I was probably in my late teens, I visited uh, with a uh, local physicist who had actually been uh, a PhD student of Einstein's and they were also close friends. Uh, and he had a signed portrait photograph 
on his living room wall that I recall, you know, just kind of staring at. And all I knew was, you know, Einstein was a famous man. Uh, I didn't really know much about you know, exactly what, why he was so famous, but that kind of stuck with me. And I think that's what started me on this collection um, as I was trying to learn and understand myself what relativity was about. Um, that's, you know, as I was learning, I would be looking at his photographs. And um, anyway, that's what they've done for me. So I wanted to, uh, I felt like I had acquired this collection over probably a 25 year period. And uh, I just wanted to be able to share it uh, with other people. Uh, we were fortunate to work with a book designer and a publisher who were willing to make a book that would actually reproduce the photographs almost exactly. So um, anyway, that's kind of the long and the short of the history of it and why the photographs. Wonderful. And Michael, did you want to follow up, talk about? Well, I want to show the book because it's such a large book. And I guess you don't have that sense, you know, when you see it online, but it is, there you go. <laughs> so when Gary talks about reproducing photographs at real size, I mean, they take up, they are, they are the real size. They're eight and a half by 11, some are oversized, nine by 12s. And, uh, and the book designer that he mentioned, Yolanda Cuomo, she added all these things like uh, overlays, fold outs, and it's, um, I mean, <laughs> This the design is her idea, the, the work of art, turning the book into really an art book as much as anything else is all her doing as well. So, but it is, it's a large coffee table book in addition to the text and, and the information that's in it. And as Gary said, there are anecdotes on one side, what's happening in Einstein's life, and then an image that is a jumping off point for the story on the other side. I know you two are not just collaborators on this book, but also on Gary's collection. Um, could you elaborate more on your history, how you met? I answered the phone in 2005. We had to look back. I was like, I feel like I've known Gary for 20 years and just about 20 years. It was 2005 and he just called to talk about some books. And I think he ended up buying a Winston Churchill set. So it wasn't Einstein related, <laughs> but we did talk about Einstein and he said he was interested in developing a collection of, of Einstein material, specifically photographs. And I knew someone who had some. So I said, you know, let me, that, that really appealed to me because as I, I dealt a lot in science and I have a scientific background myself. And I said, well, that's, that's, you know, something I can, I can understand and handle. <laughs> so I began looking and Gary and I, over the years, we really, this has been a journey in understanding Einstein and a lot of 20th century science together. I mean, we email constantly reading things, asking our thoughts, trying to work out things together. So it's not, it was much more than uh, building a collection. It was really a journey we took learning about Einstein and as I mentioned, science in general for the 20th century. Very enjoyable. Yeah, it was actually about 10 years before we met. Um, yeah. We just communicated by email, you know, on everything. And then uh, I think it was in 2015, I, uh, asked Michael if he would come to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where I am located, uh, to help me organize things because I had just been acquiring, you know, this piece or that piece. And I had no, it was, they were all just stacked up, you know, in my study, basically. And he came, uh, took photographs of everything and really helped to begin to organize it. And that's, I think probably maybe it was five years ago or so that I suggested to him, that, you know, why don't we take some of these, you know, what we think are the best things to display from the collection and put it in a book for other people so they can see it. And that's. So it took about five, five years from. Well, what happened is after 2015, when I went and saw him, I thought, thought the best way to organize this was to have pictures and text picture. And I actually asked a graphic designer to just lay it out for our own, you know, organizational, whatever, just so he would have something nice to look at. We could access it. And as the graphic designer was laying it out, who was pretty talented, it started looking really good. And then 
it took that was 2015. So I think it was 2019 when Gary was like, you know, I think other people might enjoy seeing this too. <laughs> so, so we did have a template already that was developing over time. The book opens with the quote, imagination is much more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. How did you decide on that as the opening quote? I think that is basically gets to the essence of why Einstein is the genius that he was. Uh, Einstein, there are many different things uh, we could talk about Albert Einstein, but uh, what he was saying there, you know, it's more imagination is more important than knowledge because other physicists had the same knowledge that he did of the facts but it was his ability to imagine and reorient the facts in such a way or the knowledge in such a way that he came up with an entire new system of physics and that was the difference i mean uh so the imagination part you know involving creativity and how he uh you know we could talk about his love of music or his thought experiments which is how he visualized a, a problem to simplify it in such a way that he could then translate that visual uh image uh into mathematical terms and so he was utilizing not only uh you know very sophisticated um, logic and mathematics, but um, the creative side of the brain, uh, which is, you know, that's, I think, I believe that's what he was talking about, why imagination is more important than knowledge. When Gary mentions the thought experiments. That is, I, I mean, the, the, his greatest discoveries were mental exercises. And he uses examples, the clocks ticking, elevators moving, things that we can all relate to. And I mean, it's, it's it's obviously very complicated to prove what he's trying to prove, but the the beginning and the genesis of the idea is is a thought experiment. And he would come up with these ideas and then he would challenge the experimental physicist to prove him, prove him right, see if it works. But he's living in the mind. And if he were bound by knowledge, maybe he's not making that leap to the originality that he was able to make. I, I love that, the idea of that imagination and curiosity and that, that is what made him him you know when you when you look at the photographs and maybe michael can show some of what i see in them almost um consistently regardless of his age is this sort of like when you look at his eyes <laughs> they have kind of a dreamy look and i think you know he is he's living He's able to um, remove the external environment and apply these various um, different ways that the brain, you know, can interpret reality. And this is what he's doing. I, I always see that that that's the thing that draws me most to these uh, in these pictures is you know, the gaze in his eyes. I think uh, there are other things. Well, like, I don't know if you want to talk about each individual picture at this point, but like, um, he was a very um, unique individual because uh, he, as, as the picture showed uh, when he was, uh, Michael, he, uh, that caught my attention was uh, the one with no socks at his um, oh, yeah. <laughs> ceremony course. where he was becoming a U.S. citizen. <laughs> you know, that was characteristic. Movie. He didn't like wear, he didn't like to wear socks. And he even commented at one point, he said, you know, I'm of an age where if I don't want to wear socks, I don't have to. <laughs> so, it, in fact, uh, when he went to the White House to visit President Roosevelt, uh, he was dressed in a suit and no socks in his shoes. So he had these, 
endearing, I would say, um, you know, quirks that make him stories about him so uh, entertaining. And but they point to, you know, that's one of the little things that points to that he was really, you know, a real person. He wasn't just, um, you know, this, I think for younger people, uh, picture him as, you know, the wild haired genius, but that's that's a, a short part of the uh, entire story. The quote that I, I love that, this is uh, someone said, a friend of his said about him, but he's trying to paraphrase how Einstein lived. Long hair minimizes the need for barbers, Socks can be done without. One leather jacket solves the coat problem for many years. The coat problem. Suspenders are superfluous. So it's, it's, yeah, it was basically, it's you know, simple in in the way he lived. Very simple and humble, uh, unpretentious. And again, I think, you know, he was a man who lived within his own mind, uh, you know, most of the time, then that's how he was able to accomplish what he did. It's what interesting. The, the unpretentious. We... Go ahead. The, the unpretentiousness. Um, we were thinking one of the things we liked talking about was, you know, what do these pictures teach us as he ages? And something I've thought about in his older pictures, he seems more vulnerable. Like, look at this one. This is a famous picture. It's actually the cover of our book. And there's a I good story behind this picture. But as he became more famous, I think he became, you know, in some of his young pictures, he seems a little very sure of himself, you know, I guess he had to be that way to make his way in the world. But as he got older, he seemed more humble, more self-effacing, and just more vulnerable. I mean, these eyes, look at that, that's this shot. That's a, that's not, doesn't look like a man who uh, is wearing celebrity with, with pride and any kind of arrogance. Yeah, and I think you're right about uh, when he was younger, um, he didn't uh, get along too well with some of his professors. He was very self-confident. Uh, and uh, even at his you know early age, uh, he was distrustful of authority. He didn't take anything, you know, simply because somebody else said that's the way it is. He had to work it out for himself. Um, so as a result of his independence and his, I guess, lack of respect somewhat for authority, uh, you know, he was not able to uh, secure a university position when he graduated from what we would call college. Uh, and that's what led him in some ways, that's probably an essential part of his story too, the fact that the academic world rejected him he wound up uh, as a patent clerk in Bern, Switzerland, uh, where he was reviewing patents every day that had to do with clocks uh, and synchronizing clocks, uh, because that's when the railroad uh, railroads were developing and they had to be able to synchronize train schedules. So he was thinking about these things all the time. Uh, and I wonder, you know, had he um, originally been able to work within a university system whether he actually would have been as creative as as he was you know during his miracle year we a lot of the stories there's a famous it, line it, that says that uh you know he used to challenge authority oh, that he used to challenge authority when he was young and now as an older person he's being punished by becoming authority himself so that's yeah. the the spin on him as he aged. Uh, he also, we talked about the, the thought experiments earlier and how it seems like he's so lost in his own thoughts and his own mind. Um, there are many people who've told us stories about him walking around Princeton and you know, just almost like in his own world that people would, would try talking to him and, and he'd pretend that would either pretend he didn't hear them or just honestly not hear him, hear the, the person Probably because not. he's so lost in his own thoughts. Sure. Uh, and, Go ahead. story in Princeton about um, when somebody, somebody called uh, the uh, called, I guess, uh, to the main number at the Institute uh, and said, uh, can you tell me where Dr. Einstein lives? 
And they said, well, no, we don't give that information out. And he said, I'm Dr. Einstein. Can you please tell me my address? You know, that was the kind of thing. He spent his time thinking about other things, shall True, we say. True, uh, absent-minded professor. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you see any trend in the photographs at, at, as they evolved over time, young to old, um, from his time in Germany, Switzerland, his time in Princeton? Oh, definitely. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Michael, why don't you start with show the photograph of him at age 16? Um, yeah, I'll get to that in a second. Let me go back to that. This is this is one of the earliest sign photos that exists. That exists, yeah. Yeah, well, signed this to a fellow classmate. I mean, and there he is, um, you know, as a sixteen-year-old, big head of hair. Um, he even at age sixteen, this is the amazing thing about him. He was already uh, beginning his thought experiments. You know, he says that that's when he first. I began to wonder what it would, what a light beam would look like if he could run alongside it. And that if that were possible, um, then it's, it's simply not possible for a light, for a wave form to exist independently of time. So he was already starting to think about, you know, the issue of time and light. Um, at this early age. That's when um, he wasn't getting along so well with some of his professors, uh, his his mathematics professor uh, described him as a lazy dog and thought he would never amount to anything. <laughs> so he was kind of a little pistol, I would say, you know, as a teenager, he was very self-confident, um, somewhat disrespectful you know if he disagreed uh sometimes he would um embarrass could embarrass uh one of his professors during a class if he disagreed with him uh, so that's what i see you know in in that photograph as he as he ages uh particularly probably um having to do with external events uh and world war ii um you begin to see in the photographs uh a more um as michael described it sort of a more aimed or um i i would say you know less confident and a more vulnerable vulnerable look so this the next photograph is interesting that shows him, um, yeah, there he is. That's what he looked like uh, at the first Salve conference. So he He's was- 32 in this picture. Yeah, I mean, um, to me, you know, he was a very uh, attractive man. Uh, and that's when he was just emerging at the height of his powers. I think the- um, Again, but I my, when I look at the photograph, you know, I already see that look in his eyes that it's kind of, he's looking at the camera, but it's still, I think he's not really seeing the camera. It's interesting I, in this photo in 1911, he's, uh, so, so it's this gathering of the greatest scientists, mostly physicists in the world. And he's, he's looked upon, it's, it's, it's six years after his great 1905 papers, and he still looked upon with suspicion because uh, someone commented that he had all these theories, but none have actually been proven. So there's that imagination again and how he was different than the other scientists. So it took a long time, as we know, and there's various reasons uh, for this, for people to really appreciate or even accept at this point it was special relativity, but then later general relativity as well. One of one of the other things that we, we were noticing is how many times Einstein has been photographed over the years with uh, other famous people, whether from history or celebrities. Uh, in in the book, uh, I had remarked I I thought uh, it was a great inclusion of Einstein 
with Tagore. And I know he's been photographed with uh, Indira Gandhi, a, a number of different people. I, I wonder if you, if do you have a favorite in your collection or do you have a number of these images of Einstein with other famous people? Um, I think- Gary, do you wanna take favorites? Well, I think the photograph with Tagore is probably the best one that we have, you know, with somebody else. Um, we've got vignettes, little stories of his interactions with other people, but uh, those are often tied to the, um, I think my preference obviously <laughs> was for portrait photographs of him. We have some with other people and we have some candid photographs, but uh, I, I just gravitated to the, um, you know, the full face type of photo. And, and looking at portrait photography and Einstein, it was a developing art and so many of the most famous and best portrait photographers of, of, of the, each decade would go and seek Einstein out. So something that kept occurring to me when we were assembling this was looking through, looking at Einstein portraits is almost like looking at a history of portrait photography. It, it, it's, it's fascinating. I, everybody had to photograph Einstein at some point if you were a famous photographer. And there's no one else I could think of during this period who could say that. And Einstein got a little sick of it, of course, and he joked that if he had to write down his profession at this point, this is maybe in the uh, 1940s, he would put down photographer's model rather than physicist. So I always like that. I imagine there's- uh, But Gary, do you also... have a favorite one? Go ahead. Gary, do you want to talk about a favorite photo? Uh, show the uh, photo of him uh, listening to music. Okay. I think that's one. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Now that's an interesting photograph because to me, um, music was a, a you know essential part of Einstein's life. He uh, learned to play the violin uh, at an early age. Uh, he was uh, apparently pretty good uh, at it, and um, he often, when he would uh, encounter a problem that he couldn't seem to solve. <clears throat> um, he would often resort to playing his violin or uh, listening to music. And um, his son, Hans Albert, uh, you know, describes that this would often solve his problem. So again, it brings me back to this fascination that I have of how was he so creative, um, you know, that I, music was part of it. Um, music activates um, pathways in the brain uh, that are completely different from the, you know, higher level uh, functions that he would have to be constant, you know, uh, when he was focused on uh, trying to solve a problem, particularly in mathematical language. Um, he would resort to the language of music. And he even said that, um, and this is a quote, um, he said, I often think in music. I live my daydreams in music. Um, I see my life in terms of music. So to me, that's fascinating. How does music it obviously was a critical, you know, part of Einstein's life. And um, so this is one of the reasons this particular uh, picture, you know, fascinates me. I like it. There's another picture that uh, Michael, I've pointed out to Michael many times. Um, that's just a picture that makes me think of him, uh, That this one. You know, we think of Einstein in his later years, uh, we see him as a, kind of more frail individual, but here he is, you know, he spent his summers um, in his sailboat. He's deeply tanned. He looks relaxed, very healthy. Uh, to me, you know, he, he could have been a movie star. So I love this particular picture. 
but there are many others as well. I don't know. Why don't you, uh, Michael, you've got a couple of favorites. Why don't you show them? I do. And it's these two together. So if I were to keep one Einstein photo for myself, it's this one. And this is by Lottie Jacobi. And he had a great relationship with Lottie Jacobi. She fled the Nazis. And that always uh, made him feel warm towards her. But he, she also had a style of photography where she didn't like studio portraits. She would go visit people where they worked or where they were and try to take more casual shots. So he got approached by Life magazine. They said, you know, we want to do a story on you. And he said, well, I want the photographer to be Lottie Jacobi. And she took this photo, which is wonderful. Here he is. This is how we think of him now. Leather jacket, messed up hair. He's got a page of equations in front of him, thinking off in the distance. It's 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 a beautiful photo. When I saw this photo, and it's, it's a large photo, the first time I, I called Gary and I was like, you need this photo in your collection. <laughs> you really need it. But the irony is Life magazine rejected it. They said it wasn't respectful enough. I mean, we look at this now and... The, the the sidebar, this is about seven years later, this photo is in a MoMA exhibit as an, a work of art for portraiture of the 20th century. So, so, you know, things change. But Life magazine instead chose for that issue this photo. I love this photo, too, but it's a very different, very different feel. Here he looks authoritative. He looks strong. It's it's like... Uh, you know, he's, 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 he's the boss, <laughs> I mean, he doesn't, but it, it lacks, I, I do love this photo, but it lacks the warmth and the mystery and, and kind of just the beauty of the other photo. But this is the one that Life Magazine then went with, and it, it's not by Lottie Jacobi, and I actually have not figured out who, who, the, who took this photo. There's no credit in the issue, which I do have of Life Magazine. So the, the two juxtaposed, I really like. There was a photograph, I think and the description was was mentioning the photographer and how he really tried to get Einstein's hair under control. Uh, sometimes <laughs> that, that that was a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, he gave up. The photographer gave up, yeah. I think he, I think it said he, he tucked his hair, the hair behind his ears and uh, it was probably the most, uh, oh yeah, here, the, the most neat picture of Einstein. Oh yes, that, yeah, 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 yeah. There is a great quote in the book um, from Evelyn Einstein that said he respected children and liked their curiosity and fresh approach to life and therefore did not want to ignore them. And as we know, he was uh, known uh, for stopping to talk to children. Um, he, Evelyn said he did not want to ignore them, but I can't help but wonder if he related to their curiosity. Um, did, did you come across anything in your research that spoke to Einstein's thoughts on childhood or children, why he, he, they were appealing to him. Yeah. I'm he, amazed. I, he, but I'm sorry, Gary, no. I'm sorry. Uh, well, yeah, he basically said, you know, um, I have no special abilities. I'm only very curious. And that's what he, uh, also, you know, said about children that it's their curiosity and most of us grow out of it. We don't, we stop asking the questions, the simple questions. Uh, but he never, he, he just never gave that up. That remained with him. So I think that would, had something to do with his love for children. He related to them extremely well. And, uh, you know, you probably know the story of uh, the next door neighbor, the uh, young lady who would come over I don't know what grade she was in, maybe fourth or fifth grade. He'd come over and he would, um, she would ask for his help uh, in solving mathematical problems, and he would he would serve cookies and you know, assist her. So I think he was a very uh, kindly, uh, very warm, you know, individual. Uh, but he, it, it it was his curiosity that he pointed to as why he maybe continued thinking about a problem when somebody else, you know, would have been, been done with it, you know, with a simple explanation. I was amazed about when you, the, the number of letters that Einstein wrote to children. He, he answered, he, children wrote to him all the time and he answered them with respect. It's sometimes, we have, we have several examples Actually, Gary had one in particular I really liked in his collection where a, a student wrote to him saying, you know, my teacher says I'm wrong 
I think it was that two line, two parallel lines never meet. Uh -huh. But um, I know that, I know, Dr. Einstein, you've written something that says they do. <laughs> and my teacher said, if I can get you to say that, she'll, she'll raise my grade. And sure enough, you know, he gave this explanation about, about space warping, et cetera, and, um, and, and wrote back to him so he can get his grade improved. But there's a whole book of Einstein letters to children. And that's where I got the Evelyn Einstein quote from. She wrote the introduction to that book. And it's a wonderful little book. It's really wonderful. Michael, your epilogue includes examples uh, of what a cultural icon Einstein has become, not just in Princeton, uh, world, worldwide. Uh, what do you think it is about him that makes him such a fascinating figure to the entire world? Well, I have thought about that a lot because as I, as Gary mentioned, when you go through all these photos, you do feel like you know him and you're like, why you look at other pictures of people and don't feel that way. And I think it's because he is this, was this, you know, he's this genius and yet he is relatable. He has, when you read, I, I own, I personally own a letter where he's writing to his son and it's the letter really moves me because he's trying, this is the son who had schizophrenia and, and had a lot of difficulties and he had trouble relating to him. And he's trying to get to know, to, to reestablish contact. And he's saying like, um, you know, can we read the same books together? He actually mentioned Shakespeare, which I, I particularly like. And it's a lovely letter where it's just a father talking to his son. He's not some out there person not connected to reality. He's very much grounded. And and then with the look, the no socks, the hair and all that stuff, it makes it, you know, you, you almost want to make fun of him, but you don't because he's a genius. But, um, so all of this, he has so many aspects that, that it sounds like if he were a neighbor, you could go talk to him. You could go knock on his door. There's no artifice and there's no barrier or wall. And I think that fascinates me and it fascinates other people that you have this genius who like actually encourage you, who, who's normal, who you could talk to if he, if he were around. And I love that. And, and of course, now this is taken to an extreme where I was at the, uh, I was at the World War II Museum in, in New Orleans a couple of weeks ago, and there was an Einstein bobblehead. And that sounds ridiculous, but <laughs> I actually saw a listing at an auction site recently for something that looked like an Einstein trading card, like a baseball card. <laughs> you know, about it. so so. Well, and, what about and, the mural in New York yes, City? Yes. Okay. I want. I want to. I want to show that. So I use this as my jumping off point. Uh, my office was right, right next to this huge mural, and I would look at it all the time. And not only I would look at it; tourists would stop and take pictures of it. So this is at at Forty Eighth Street and Third Ave here in New York. Wow. There it is. It's wonderful. It's huge. It's it, it's how many flights? Eight floors eight flights uh, of a building and it's just everybody knows it's Einstein and the artist uh, Eduardo Cobra he has other murals around the city and they're you know Michael Jackson David Bowie Janis Joplin and here's Albert Einstein because he's just as cool <laughs> I mean it sounds shallow to say he's cool but he's just as iconic he transcends you, you don't have to know anything about science to appreciate what he's done you just you know, he, he's Albert Einstein. He's, he's, he's like no other, but I do love this mural. I've, I've stared at this so many times. That's amazing. I've never seen that one. That's wonderful. Yeah. You, if you walk by, you could miss it. <laughs> I think that's a perfect place to open up the, um, the discussion to questions. I see there's a good number of questions in the Q and a, um, so I will turn that over to Cliff to ask the, the questions there. Sure. Thanks Eve. Um, so the first question is from Heath Tuttle, who asks, do we have any idea what developed Einstein's great vision or insight? Jerry, do you want to take that? Do we have any idea? Well, that is the fascinating question to me, you know, is how he came to these insights, and we know some of it, we've talked about, um, you know, his using um, his so-called daydreaming, which was really uh, kind of a relaxed way of letting his imagination free. Um, I think that clearly is part of it. Uh, his ability to use music again in a similar way. Uh, 
probably when he was playing uh, or listening to music. Uh, he was relaxed enough that he would let be able to let his imagination go, run freely again. And I think that's kind of the, that's essential to his creativity, but it does not, it's not adequate to explain it because he also, uh, you know, was using advanced math, uh, mathematics, you know, he had access to languages or knowledge that would be very difficult for most of us to understand. So he's a very complex individual, simple, unassuming, um, a very, um, you know, a humanitarian, uh, defending, uh, always, you know, defending uh, people's rights um, and insistent, I think, critical to him, uh, insisting on the right to be able to think and speak freely. Um, so all of these are wrapped up together, um, but I would love to be, to be able to say, oh, you know, I really do understand how Einstein was able to be Einstein. Um, I, that is what fascinates me. I think it's what will keep me, uh, trying to learn more about him. Um, and, you know, that's, I don't know if you have anything that you can add to that, Michael? Well, I just keep thinking of a lot of his papers, his scientific papers begin with, what would happen if? And he looked at a lot of things in life with that. Like, what would happen if, you know, mm -hmm. I could travel to special light? What would happen if, you know, and, and, and or, or why? Why, why, why? So there's this restlessness of just trying to understand. And I, I don't know. I mean, I go through life <laughs> seeing, I'm sure seeing tons of things without asking those questions in my head, but he must, he, those questions must have always been in his head. And, and I'm, I've been reading a lot about Richard Feynman lately, and he's the same thing. He's, people always said that he'd be in a room and just this simple thing, like, why is the, the, the plate spinning like this? Why is it just something? And then, oh, and then he, goes back to, and you that. right. You know, so that goes back to his childhood uh, that he described you know, uh, the first time when uh, he was given a compass and he saw the needle and, you know, he, most of us, you know, went, okay, that's a compass and, you know, that's pretty cool. But, <laughs> uh, you know, he, even as a child, he was wondering, what is it? There's some invisible force that's making this needle always point in the same direction. So he had that curiosity and, you know, questioning from a very early age. Uh, and that's, I, again, you know, what he describes that he never lost that apparently. Whereas most of us, when we grow up, well, I know for myself, you know, I'm always aware I spend probably 90% of my time doing things, you know, that have to be done, answering email, but, uh, you know, the everyday things that you just have to do it's you know either part of your job or you know and einstein minimized all of that to the simplest so that he had the maximum amount of time uh that he could think and I, that's one one thing that uh you know comes across pretty clearly to me in you know as i've learned about his life and persistence in trying to answer those questions even even unified field theory, which he ultimately didn't succeed, he couldn't let it go. Be, and that's right. that's part of how his mind is working. I need to keep trying. I need to keep trying. And and he had confidence that he thought he could figure these things out. If I were looking at the compass at his age, I'd be like, well, it's got to be something complicated. And then you move on to your next thing. <laughs> yeah. In his mind, he's like, and I can figure it out. Well, I mean, it took him ten years to go from the you know, develop the special relativity to generalize it to his general theory. And then he spent the last 25 years of his life, you know, searching for a unified theory that would be able to, because what had happened because of Einstein, um, you know, he, uh, 
basically established uh, that atoms were real, uh, that light uh, wasn't just a wave, but it had a dual wave and particle characteristics. And um, then with the general theory of relativity, uh, you know, he developed a theory of gravity that pretty much explains everything we know about the universe. But that and the quantum theory simply don't fit together. And so naturally, the next step, now that he had essentially brought quantum theory to life uh, with his, uh, you know, what he had uh, developed in terms of um, explaining the photoelectric effect uh, and then um, special relativity, um, he the, the next logical thing would be to uh, try to make quantum theory and general relativity compatible. So that's where the idea of a unified underlying theory of everything, so to speak, you know, uh, would be. And at the time that he was devoting him, uh, himself to this, um, most of the other physicists thought he was, you know, he was over the hill, he had lost his abilities, and he really um, was no longer in the mainstream of physics. But uh, now that is kind of the, probably one of the most important areas of uh, work that's going on in physics now is to try to uh, make these two completely separate theories compatible with each other. One that um, explains what's happening in the atomic world and the other explains what's happening in the macro world. So Einstein was always uh, right up until the very time of his death. Um, you know, when he was his last days in the hospital, uh, he was still working, uh, trying to find the solution, you know, to to the next question. So uh, to me, I obviously, you know, I think that I um, have a almost a reverence, you know, for the man because he had these uh, wonderfully human qualities and this, um, you know, just uh, intellectual um, quality that I think for anybody who values um, discovery and um, intellectual pursuits, I can't think of a better role model, you know, anyone that you could emulate more than Albert Einstein. Shall we take another question? I think there's one that's apt that I uh, actually came up in the chat. Um, it sort of continues what you were talking about, Gary. Uh, Elizabeth Romano asks, well, she states and then asks, I love that Einstein chose to walk among the townspeople. Can you imagine a modern famous person doing that? That's part of that's part of what we're talking about. His wonderful charm, and and you must have so many stories in Princeton about that. That is a really good question. I'm trying to think of who would be like that. There have to be people that would be like that, but nobody's jumping to mind immediately. Yes. But yeah, that is that is his charm. That's that's the, what we're talking about. He seems. I don't know. It's almost like he didn't understand the attention he was getting. Like, I don't know. That's 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 my feeling when you when you see this. That's he's just he's just himself. That's it. It's, yeah, I'm, I'm 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 Albert Einstein. I'm walking. I'm I'm doing my errands. We have a picture somewhere that's not in the book of him carrying milk jugs with with a friend. Just, yeah, you know, standing in the getting... backyard. I know. <laughs> I I call it you know just two guys hanging out. He's standing with somebody. We don't know who it is yet, uh, but and they're both holding cans of gasoline in their hands. And I'm thinking, you know, as I look at this photograph, what are they going to do? Mow the lawn, or what? What exactly, you know, were they up to? Oh, and and the, someone contacted me, who's the is the niece of somebody in one of the pictures with Einstein, and she said, "Oh, we always hung out with him." And she had said, "I had, I, you know, she was like eight, nine years old." She said, "I had no idea he was famous until later." <laughs> that's, that's so wonderful. Uh huh. 
That'd be a great prize. Okay, um, so this is a question, and this is a more specific question. Um, uh, Janie Herman asks, what is written on the photograph from Life Magazine? It is very faint. Sure, let me, let me. Uh, it's an inscription, and uh, I can call that up again. Let's see, do you have that? It's the photo. So almost all of these are inscribed. So this is the one we're talking about. And it says it's 1938. The book is arranged chronologically, as we mentioned. And we haven't highlighted, but it's interspersed with pictures of, of his papers and some manuscripts too. We get a feel of what he's doing scientifically during this time. Okay, here it is. It says, Oh yeah, it's it's inscribed to Herr Reeves, Albert Einstein, 1938. And Herr Reeves was an important figure. He was a writer, literary agent for Winston Churchill. And his his big connection to Einstein was he was very, very much anti-Nazi and a pacifist at the same time. So they had that to wrestle with together. And uh, they they jointly discussed those things at the time. This is 1938, so very, very difficult time. But that's who it's inscribed to at the top. Well, not in the top, I'm sorry, above the pipe right here. Yeah. Excellent, thanks. Um, okay, so there's another book related question, but then a sort of more uh, expansive one. So I'll, I'll ask the book related one first, and then we'll move to the larger question about Einstein. So um, the I think that I know the answer, but I'll let you speak to it. So uh, Steve Friedlander asks, any photos in color? Uh, it's a four color, how do they describe it? Yeah, there's, it's not, it's not, uh, there's four separate colors in these photographs, even the black and white ones. Uh, but it's, that's the extent of it. I think they have different, on different pages, you can see like there's different shading or hues, uh, but it's, yeah, the, it's reproducing the actual photographs. So most of these photographs are black and white photos. In in fact, it is very very rare to see a color photo, at least a formal photo. These these most of the time these were given the formal ones were given for him to hand out. This photo that we're looking at right now, the Life Magazine one, was actually printed in color in Life Magazine. I have to say it looks kind of odd. I I have that at my office, but not here. The actual how it appeared in the magazine. So it did appear in color, but then the, the the examples he would have been given to give out to people were the formal, more traditional black and white. Yes, there was definitely color photography by this time in the early 50s, but um, yeah, there are very few Einstein photos in color. In fact, there are none in your collection. The only ones I've seen are in magazines are glossy, not, not, the, I mean, not, not the standalone photos. Yeah, Gary, have you Great. seen any? I can't even think of any. Sorry. Okay. I think, Gary, is what you're talking about sepia tone? Is that what you're thinking of with the four colors? Yes. Um, that might be right. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right, uh, coming to this, the uh, more complicated question about Einstein, I think a couple of complicated ones. Uh, so Vincott asks, who were some of Einstein's closest friends and how did they influence his work? And then as a, as a follow-up, did Einstein have any significant mentors or teachers who guided his scientific journey? I would love to talk about his relationship with Niels Bohr because the, the Bohr and Einstein back and forth, I, they, they were close friends. They were on the opposite side of so many aspects of especially quantum mechanics, but their discussions and big debates were so fertile and spurred so many experiments and so much discovery. So they kind of constantly bounced off each other their entire careers. There's the um, there's a very famous line when they were discussing quantum mechanics and and Bohr and his Copenhagen school, as it was known. Uh, there, it's complicated, but they didn't believe in um, his his line was shut up and calculate. We can we can we can model things without, without knowing 
um, exactly what's happening and things may not happen with strict causality. And this drove Einstein crazy, which prompted Einstein's famous uh, God doesn't play dice comment, which Bohr then responds, well, Einstein stopped telling God what to do. So that's the kind of relationship they had. And, you know, that got a lot of laughs at the time. But but these conversations went on and on their entire careers. And you see you see accounts of their their back and forth. And there was so much affection. You know, it's, it's professional arguments, but they there was a lot of affection and respect on both sides. So I, I consider Bohr his greatest uh, kind of intellectual peer at the time throughout his career. Yeah, he had, um, uh, he had uh, a few very, very close friends that he maintained uh, for his life uh, that, you know, he went to school with uh, Marcel Grossman, uh, who helped him when he couldn't uh, get a position in a university, he helped him get a job uh, at the uh, patent office in Bern. Um, and I think he uh, also was uh, a good friend of Einstein's that um, when Einstein uh, would skip going to classes, mathematics class, um, Grossman would, uh, you know, let, lend him his notes. And that's what got him through, uh, you know, the math courses in college or what, what I would call college. Um, and then Michelle Besso was his best personal friend. Um, again, they were part of, they they were a group, I think there was a group of five of them um, when they were at the university uh, who formed, they formed a uh, club called, they called themselves the Olympia Academy. And they would meet, you know, weekly to discuss books and philosophy and whatever, you know, uh, it was pretty wide ranging, but he maintained those friendships, you know, uh, for the rest of his life. And uh, one letter that um, I had in the collection that I loved, uh, it's now at the Einstein archives um, in Jerusalem, uh, but he wrote uh, this letter uh, very late in life uh, to his friend, Michelle Besso, and he said, uh, after 50 years of uh, conscious uh, deliberation, I'm no closer to understanding what light quanta are. And I just thought, you know, again, that seemed kind of characteristic of Einstein, that, you know, the man who knows more about light quanta than anybody in the world <laughs> is saying he really doesn't understand what they actually are. But that was... That was a, also uh, something that distinguished Einstein from all of the other physicists of the late um, 20th century. And uh, because he maintained uh, that, uh, how did he say it? Um, I don't believe that... Um, physics can be described, reality can be described in terms of probability, only probability. Um, what is the, uh, do you have the, that exact quote? Let me get it. The page of the book. I think to, to me, this is what separated him from the rest of the physics community. I don't believe that the fundamental laws of physics may consist in relations between probabilities for the real things but for relations concerning the things themselves and there he was addressing his um his uh concern that quantum mechanics was not a complete underlying theory that because it could only describe things in probabilities uh, he didn't feel that that was, that underlying that, there had to be some more deterministic um, theory that could e explain the actual, actual events, not just potential events, but the actual things. So I think um, that's, that's one of the uh, fundamental um, philosophical 
positions that Einstein took, that he was a realist. He believed that there is a real world um, and the, uh, independent of anyone's perception of it. So this goes completely against, you know, the accepted um, philosophy, I think, of quantum mechanics. Um, the way that Einstein would express it very simplistically was, you know, he said, well, if I'm not looking at the moon, does it cease to exist? And, and um, I don't know if I'm explaining it well enough, um, Michael, maybe you can help out, but, you know, he, he believed there is an external reality and that physics, uh, the role of physics is to be able to describe it. And, um, you know, as opposed to Niels Bohr, who you brought up, um, whose position was basically, well, there is no actual in the atomic, when you get down to the level of atoms, no, there is no reality independent of our ability to perceive it. It's only when you measure something that you can, you know, that's that's when it occurs. So I find all of this still uh, somewhat confusing. I The way that I interpret it is, it has to do with um, with time that we all know kind of um, from our own experience. Well, when we think of the future, we're always thinking in terms of probability. We can't predict exactly what's going to happen. So we, we're dealing in probabilities. It's only until an event actually occurs with the passage of time that we can say, Absolutely, you know, yes, this is determined. So I'm getting off into the, um, you know, the philosophy of science. Einstein was very clear, you know, where he stood. And um, again, I think he went from in his 20s and 30s, you know, from having basically brought the rest of the uh, science community to the point of accepting quantum theory uh, to then challenging it and saying, but it's not enough. And, you know, consistent with his, uh, his entire life of inquiry. So I guess that's, that's all that I will say about that. Well, just to, to to put a bow on that part, I think one of the reasons perhaps that that bothered him so much was because he couldn't visualize the the things I mean, with 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 everything by probability and just numbers and stat. He couldn't visualize it. He couldn't create a picture. And that's his greatest discoveries are by picturing things. And maybe that's why he was at odds with how other people were thinking. So his greatest strength when he was younger made him perhaps struggle more with with those concepts later. So are there more Q&A questions or I, I have one question to uh, to close on? Uh, sure, let's close up there. That sounds good. All right, so my, my last question, I thought it would be topical uh, with uh, Oppenheimer winning best picture. Uh, I thought I would mention that you do have uh, an image of, of Einstein um, from the film that was made after uh, World War II, where they sort of recreated um, Einstein's role in in the in the Manhattan Project, uh, so uh -huh. I, I I thought if, if you wanted to speak to that at all, the the movie did somewhat distort Einstein's role a little bit, um, or embellish his role a little bit in in <laughs> that's it, that's the picture. Uh, so I just yeah. thought I, I I would ask your comments on on the his role in Oppenheimer in the Manhattan Project? Uh, well, with, with regard to the Manhattan Project, it's interesting because <clears throat> Einstein uh, was a pacifist. And however, he was also a realist. And so when, um, you know, he was, he had to uh, leave Germany or he had a price on his head. 
uh, being being a Jew, and uh, so he was basically convinced to sign a letter to stimulate the president to uh, you know start this project uh, because there uh, he had been. Uh, another physicist, Leo Sislard, had uh, come to him to say, you know, to report that um, the uranium atom had been split. And when they, Einstein, when he developed his uh, most famous equation of all E equals MC squared, um, you know, it demonstrated that a small amount of mass could produce an enormous amount of energy, but he didn't believe that that would actually ever be seen. This was a, you know, he, he was, uh, this was theory. So, um, but when the implications of the splitting of the atom were really reviewed with him, uh, he realized, yes, uh, and he was afraid that uh, the Germans would develop an atomic bomb and basically become the rulers of the world. So here is this pacifist who then, uh, you know, takes this completely different position and becomes a militant pacifist, as he describes, uh, helps to get the uh, Manhattan Project going. He never participated in it. Uh, and when the bomb was actually used, uh, uh, he was quoted as saying, woe is me. Uh, and he spent then again immediately and, uh, you know, devoted a large part of his life thereafter to trying to uh, work on behalf of control of nuclear energy, um, nuclear weapons. Uh, he always advocated for world government because he saw that as the only way to prevent future wars. And somebody asked him, uh, in fact, in one of the photographs uh, where yeah. he has, a, I think, a particularly sad look in his eyes, uh, the photographer uh, asked him, so, um, Dr. Einstein, uh, do you believe that, um, you know, men, uh, how is it that we will always have war? I have, I have the quote. I have the, yeah, I have the quote right here. And this is quote. from yeah. Steve yeah. Uh, he says, um, says uh, okay, he, Einstein spoke about his despair. This is with this photograph. He spoke about his despair that his formula equals MC squared and his letter to President Roosevelt had made the atomic bomb possible. That his scientific resulted in the death of so many human beings. Have you read, he asked, that powerful voices in the United States are demanding Russia now before the right own? With my entire being, I felt this infinitely good and compassionate man was suffering from the knowledge that he had helped among approaching them. This moment almost paralyzed me. Then, with an effort, I released the shutter of my camera, this photo. Einstein looked up right now in this photo, and I asked him, so you don't believe that there will ever be peace? No, he answered, as long as... There will be there will be wars. So that's the story behind this photo. It's right on the heels of the atomic bomb. His expression's incredible in the photo. Yeah, Michael, I'm not sure the quote came through in the audio. Like the Did anyone else have audio issues where Michael was oh. reading? I saw it cut a little bit out. Yeah. Okay. Did you want to read the quote one more time, Michael, just for the for the recording? As long as there is man, there will be. Yeah, I mean, the, the, that's the part, right? So the the he took this picture right when um, Halsman asked him if Einstein had any hope for peace, and Einstein said, "And will be, in this case, wars means atomic bombs." So Einstein is not optimistic about the future. Yeah, happy again. So I think the quote was, "As long as there will be men, there will be war." Then am I getting that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, uh, it's a, 
uh, unfortunate place to end. Yeah, grim, I think. Grim way to look at things. Yeah, and and an unfortunate place for our program to end as well. Um, <laughs> but I, I think we have come to the end. So uh, I don't know if anyone has any last remarks they want to offer, but um, otherwise we can wrap up here. And I, I just think we've captured so many different signs of Einstein. You know, the the the, the one who liked children, who was curious, uh, the creative. Uh, so many different sides to him, and I, I, you know, obviously encourage everyone to uh, to check out the book. I know it is available at the library, right, Cliff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe so. Um, so, yeah, I guess maybe there's a positive place to end with uh, public libraries, uh, historical societies, excellent scholars writing wonderful books. Uh, thank you both for coming and sharing this excellent program with us. And uh, yes, do check out the book, uh, which is a treasure. Thank you. We Thank should so mention much. all the proceeds of the book are going to the Einstein archives at Hebrew University. So it's all going to preserve documents and things for Einstein for history. Excellent. That's wonderful to know. And thank you for having us. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, I think we will stop here then. And uh, I wish everyone a great night. Okay. Good night.